Hello everyone. Today in this lecture we will try to learn about rickets. Under rickets, we will learn about the pathophysiology of rickets, the clinical features of rickets, radiological findings of rickets, approach to rickets, treatment of rickets. We will solve two three MCQs and then we will close this session. That is how we are going to proceed in this short lecture series. Okay, for us to understand rickets, we need to first understand the physiology of vitamin D3 synthesis in our body. So as you know, as you see it in the picture, uh, most of the vitamin D3 we get from the source sunlight. That is almost 80 to 90 percent we get from the sunlight. Remaining 10 to 20 percent we get from the food we consume. In the skin, the cholesterol gets converted into vitamin D3 in the presence of sunlight. This vitamin D3 is transported into liver where it gets converted into 25 hydroxy vitamin D3 in the presence of the enzyme 25 dehydroxylase. In the presence of the enzyme 25 dehydroxylase, vitamin D3 gets hydroxylated to form 25 hydroxy vitamin D3. And from the liver, it then goes on to the kidney where it gets converted into 125 dihydroxy vitamin D3. So in the kidney, 25 hydroxy gets converted into gets hydroxylated again to form 1 and 25. At one carbon atom and 25th carbon atom, it gets hydroxylated to form vitamin D3 in the presence of the enzyme 1 alpha hydroxylase. This is the enzyme as you see it in the picture, that is 1 alpha hydroxylase. And as you uh, see it in the picture, these are the positive inducers and uh, these are the negative inducers of the enzyme. So Parathyroid hormone, decreased phosphate, decreased calcium and 24-25 hydroxy vitamin D3, dihydroxy vitamin D3 or the positive inducers for the enzyme, 25 hydroxy D3, 1 alpha hydroxylase. Whereas increased phosphate levels, increased calcium levels and 125 hydroxy vitamin, dihydroxy vitamin D3 levels are the negative inducers of the enzyme 1 alpha hydroxylase. And again, uh, it is not just uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D3. Most of the 25 hydroxy vitamin D3 gets converted into 125 dihydroxy vitamin D3, but also gets converted into 24 25 dihydroxy vitamin D3. So, as you see in the picture, 24 di 25 dihydroxy vitamin D3 is a positive inducer for the enzyme 1 alpha hydroxylase. Having studied the physiology of vitamin D3 production. Let us move on to learn uh, the various clinical features of rickets. As you see it in the picture beside you, uh, we can broadly classify this as the clinical features in the skull or head of the child, clinical features in the long bones, clinical features in the chest of the patient. So coming on to the skull, craniotapes is the softening of the skull bones. This is the earliest marker that appears as a clinical features whenever the child suffers from vitamin D deficiency. And then the sutures would be white, there would be delayed closure of fontanelle, there would be frontal bossing coming onto the teeth. Uh, teeth, uh, there occurs a dental hypoplasia. Even you can see when, when we move on, you can see here in the chest, uh, this is the Harrison sulcus. This is the Harrison sulcus as you as the arrows are pointed out and then it also forms a rachitic rosary. It forms a bead like structure like a rosary. A rosary is nothing but uh, a beads of a chain of beads. So in the form of a chain these nodules and the ribs appear as a rosary. That is why it is called as rachitic rosary because of rickets this rosary appears. That is why it is called as rachitic rosary. So these are the and it can also form uh, pectus carinatum and pectus excavatum. These two changes can occur in the chest. Coming onto the long bones, you can see in this picture like uh, there is widening of the metaphyseal plates, widening of the ends of the bones. It, either it can be in the ankle joint, at the ankle joint, or it can be at the wrist joint. There would be widening of the metaphyseal plates. 
and moving up of the long bones. These are the two changes that we observe in the long bones. In the skull, we observe cranial tapes, widening of the sutures, delayed closure of the fontanelle, frontal bossing, and dental hypoplasia. In the chest, we observe pectus carinatum, pectus excavatum, rachitic rosary, Harrison sulcus. In the long bones, we observe widening of the metaphyseal plates and bowing up of the long bones. Okay, now let us try to learn what are the radiological findings that we see in a case of rickets. As you clearly see it in the picture, we see cupping, flaring, and fraying up of the, at, fraying at the ends of the long bones. So here you see uh, cupping here. So this is the cupping you see. Here you see very clear flaring and fraying up of the long bones. So these are the typical uh, radiological findings that we find in a case of a rickets. Now, let us move on how we approach a case of rickets. As you all know, we divide the approach to rickets as calcipenic rickets, where calcium levels are low, phosphophenic rickets, where phosphorus levels are low, and the third condition where phosphorus levels are high. There is only one condition where phosphorus levels are high, that is renal osteodystrophy where the kidneys are not functioning normally, their production of 1,25-dihydroxy polycalciferol is defective. That is the reason why we get rickets in a case of renal failure. This is known as renal osteodystrophy. And, re and for the diagnosis of renal osteodystrophy, in the conclusion we make it by the high levels of phosphorus. Not only phosphorus, there would be high levels of phosphorus, there would be high levels of serum creatinine, there would be acidosis, there would be low calcium and only phosphorus levels would be high. So once we are done with high phosphorus levels, we are left with calcipenic rickets and phosphophenic rickets. Where phosphorus levels are low, where calcium levels are low. So coming on to the phosphophenic rickets, as you observe in the middle of the chart, uh, this part of the chart, that is phosphophenic rickets. The most common condition of phosphophenic rickets is familial X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets. To diagnose this condition, we check the VG levels. When we do the arterial blood gas analysis, whenever there is acidosis, we go into the diagnosis of Fanconis syndrome or what are the conditions where acidosis occurs along with rickets? One is Fanconis syndrome, renal tubular acidosis, proximal or distal. But there in renal tubular acidosis, most of the times it is the phospho uh, calcipenic rickets that occurs. So here phosphorus would not be low. Or it could be renal osteodystrophy where phosphorus would be high. So whenever there is no acidosis, we come to a conclusion of familial X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets. Whenever there is acidosis, we come to the conclusion of Fanconis syndrome. There is acidosis with low calcium levels, we go to the diagnosis of renal tubular acidosis. There is acidosis with calcium levels normal, with phosphorus low, we come to the conclusion of Fanconis syndrome. There is acidosis with phosphorus levels high, we go to the conclusion of renal acidosis. Hope I'm clear with acidosis. Acidosis, again I repeat, with acidosis, Phosphorus high, renal osteodystrophy. Phosphorus low, we go to Fanconi syndrome. Phosphorus low and calcium also low, then we go to the diagnosis of renal uh, tubular acidosis, proximal or distal. So that is about phosphophenic rickets. Coming on to the calcipenic rickets that is represented uh, in this flow chart, we, we check the levels of <coughs> Calcium levels are low, phosphorus levels are low, PTH is high. Then we go on to check 25 hydroxycholecalciferol levels. <clears throat> if 25 hydroxycholecalciferol levels are low, then it is mostly a nutritional rickets. But whenever these levels are normal, then we have to check the levels of 125 dihydroxycholecalciferol levels. So calcium low, phosphorus low, and parathyroid hormone levels are high. Then we go on to check 
25 hydroxycholic calciferol levels they are low we consider it as renal uh, sorry nutritional rickets remember 25 hydroxycholic calciferol levels are low calcium low we also need to check whether there is acidosis if there is acidosis we should go on to the diagnosis of renal tubular acidosis if there is no acidosis we go on to the diagnosis of nutritional rickets so 25 hydroxycholic calciferol levels are normal then we go on to check 125 dihydroxycholic calciferol levels so whenever these levels are low what does it indicate so there is normal 25 hydroxycholic calciferol but dihydroxy 125 dihydroxycholic calciferol levels are low that means the enzyme that converts 25 to 125 is not acting properly is deficient that is one alpha hydroxylase deficiency in one alpha hydroxylase deficiency we get vitamin dependent vitamin d3 dependent rickets type 1 that is clear so if 125 dihydroxycholic calciferol levels are high see here 25 hydroxycholic calciferol levels are normal and 125 dihydroxycholic calciferol levels are high and then why are we getting rickets there is a receptor deficiency this vitamin is not acting at the receptor level then we call it as vitamin d3 dependent rickets type 2 why does 125 dihydroxycholic calciferol levels go high remember when we studied the physiology of uh, uh, formation of vitamin d3 25 dihydroxycholic calciferol not only forms 125 it also forms 2425 this 2425 acts as a positive inducer for the enzyme one alpha hydroxylase that is the reason why we get high amounts of 125 dihydroxycholic calciferol so we also get this condition in severe dietary calcium deficiency so to summarize this uh, topic of approach to rickets we classify it as calcipenic phosphophenic and high phosphorus high phosphorus pretty clear we go to the diagnosis of renal osteodystrophy phosphorus levels are low which we go on to check acidosis so whenever there is no acidosis that is familial excellent high phosphatemic rickets whenever acidosis is, is there we go on to the diagnosis of fanconis syndrome remember and again through acidosis we can approach whenever there is acidosis along with rickets if phosphorus levels are high then it is renal osteodystrophy if phosphorus levels are low then it is fanconis syndrome if phosphorus levels are low along with calcium levels then it is renal tubular acidosis then calcipenic rickets whenever calcium phosphorus is low and parathyroid hormone levels are high we want to check 25 dihydroxycholic calciferol levels when they are low that is pure nutritional deficiency when it is normal then we go on to check 125 dihydroxycholic calciferol when it is low that is vitamin d dependent type 1 when it is high it can be either vitamin d dependent rickets type 2 or severe dietary calcium deficiency now moving on to the treatment part uh, we replenish the stores of vitamin d3 whenever they are deficient then we go on to the maintenance part during the replenishing the stores part we give it the dose of vitamin d3 up to 8 to 12 weeks of a time span after that we shift on to maintenance dose maintenance dose is somewhere ranges between 400 to 1000 international units for smaller children and it is somewhere around 3000 to 6000 international units for obese patients with malabsorption now coming on to the replenishing the stores and in, in the deficiency states we can use either daily regimen weekly regimen and stress therapy stress therapy is something where we give we replenish the stores in a single shot or within a span of one to five days so uh, the doses are given in the chart so if you have to choose one regimen i would choose daily regimen i will not choose stress therapy the reason why is toxicity levels with stress therapy would be more probable vitamin d toxicity might be possible more with stress therapy rather than a daily regimen that is the reason why we use daily regimens so depending upon the age of the child we use so and so doses so let us solve few mcqs now to test the knowledge so 
the first question is here which of the following is true regarding rickets increased alkaline phosphatase hypophosphatemia hypophosphaturia craniotypes we all know craniotypes is a feature initial feature of the okay so that might be the possible uh, true option obviously alkaline phosphatase levels would be increased so a might also be right hyperphosphatemia hyperphosphatemia is also right in certain conditions as, as i already told you that is possible in renal osteodystrophy but not in all the cases of rickets so hyperphosphatemia is a option of a little doubt hypophosphaturia so whenever vitamin d3 levels are low vitamin d is not conserved in the kidney when vitamin d3 is not conserved in the kidney phosphaturia occurs phosphate will be lost in the urine so there will be hyperphosphaturia not hypophosphaturia so definitely not uh, c option mm. possibility of b option but a and d are definitely sure so a and b are definitely true options let us check so a is the correct option and d is the correct option correct option let us move on to the so the earliest manifestation of the rickets is in the class itself i told you the earliest manifestation of the rickets among all the options harrison group craniotapes pigeon chest practic rosary the answer is obvious that is craniotapes craniotapes is the answer so thank you very much for watching this lecture please do subscribe to the channel and do watch the lecture series and be benefited thank you very much for patiently listening to the lecture thank you